motion to accept. We have a motion to accept a and a second uh, on the minutes. Seeing no discussion, hands up. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. Minutes are approved. Thank you, Nancy. We have one person signed up for public speaking, Mr. Ryan Hoffman. Uh, so, Ryan, we will call on you now to make your pitch. Okay. A little earlier than I was expecting. That's fine. Um, thank you guys for having me tonight. My name is Ryan Hoffman. I'm an agent with Farm Bureau Insurance here in Leland. I'm also the president of the Booster Club at the high school. We've got a lot of exciting things going on in North London. I'm sure most of you know um, that there was a bond that was passed a few years ago, and that money is now being dispersed in schools and projects are underway. We have $18 million worth of projects happening in North Brunswick. Currently, about uh, $4 million are on sports complexes that uh, I try to get involved with. So we have a new field house for football, uh, one for softball and soccer, and then we also just got approved about two or three weeks ago for the field turf. Um, basically, one thing I, I was talking to Chris and Michael, one, one reason why I was asked to come basically was to talk about making a connection between the town of Leland and the business owners and the high school. That's one area that we've lacked at North Brunswick for many, many years. I taught at North Brunswick for a decade before I got into insurance many years ago, so I understand this thing firsthand. Um, so really, we want to create a connection with you guys to open doors for these kids, to give them what they need to be successful. Um, and that's really kind of my mission is to uh, help provide these kids with what they need. So some of the projects we've got going on with the field house, um, we're gonna have a lot of advertising campaigns going on there. Um, and then we also have a Hall of Fame that's coming into effect that'll, that'll start this summer. Uh, where we're going to recognize uh, many, many people from uh, North Brunswick. We've, we've had 10 professional athletes, uh, 32, I believe, individual state champions, 15 team state championships. Um, I think we're actually 100 conference championships. So we're, we're pretty close to uh, the best here in Brunswick County. We've, we've had a lot going on here in North, and we need to be celebrated. So we're going to have a Hall of Fame um, that will be coming into fruition this summer. And then we also have a weight room issue that we're trying to get resolved. And, uh, and after our rotary meeting last week, we've made huge headway into some really positive things. But we have to uh, have some more work to do. So that's kind of what I'm doing. I'm, I'm here to answer any questions if you have any, and uh, I'm here to help. Anything for me? Thank you, Ryan. About how many uh, students uh, will benefit from uh, what you're doing with the weight room and other improvement facilities that were pretty much uh, a result of carnage from the storm. <laughs> so uh, there's about 1,200 students in North Brunswick currently. It's, it's actually like 1188. So I'm rounding up. I was a history teacher, so you know, just even numbers. So um, about 1,200 students and about 600 kids actually every day use a weight room facility. The current weight room that we had was 1,200 square feet. Uh, after meeting with Dr. Oates and some other some people uh, after the meeting, we're actually moving it to a 3,000 square foot facility. But now we've got to fill it with equipment. So a big room is great, but it's got to have equipment in there. But about 600 kids on, on, on average every day use that. We have about 500 athletes um, at North Brunswick, and male and female come up. So it's a lot of kids. It's a lot of kids that, that come through that on a yearly basis. So if you're talking about over the course of 10 years, that's thousands upon thousands upon thousands of kids. So. A part of the funds uh, for redoing the fields? the artificial turf, which is going on in some of the schools. Right. So that was part of the bond money as well. Uh, they had about uh, $4 million of extra um, kind of money that they could use, and that's where most of that's going, actually, is my understanding. And that's going to include drainage and all that? Drainage, the surfacing. They've already got North Brunswick, uh, the field. The fields, if you've ever been there, had a huge crown on it. They've got it leveled out. Uh, they're going to come and pour the concrete. It takes about 90 days to get the field put together. So uh, we'll hopefully have it by June 1. That's a pretty aggressive timeline at this point. But Thank you. That's the expectation. Thank you. Yep, not, not to hog it, but I have another question. Sure. Even though your focus is sports, I would ask what goes on in the school where you're looking for engagement by some businesses mm -hmm. that would otherwise encourage workforce development as alternatives oh, to going on to four year colleges. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, part of our thing is me being a teacher, my wife being a teacher, uh, you know, a teacher in the past for me, it, it's, it's very important to me. So uh, you know, the Booster Club is for athletics. However, we know that they're students first. That's what gets them enrolled in North Brunswick. So we have to help engage them. So we give them spirit wear. That's one thing we're doing. We've been giving teachers 
uh, materials they need. We, we brought pencils and all kinds of different supplies for teachers that needed those types of things. Um, we provided lunch for teachers to kind of boost morale. Um, we provided lunch for kids that needed uh, certain celebrations, things like that. Um, one thing that we would like to do, and obviously we're kind of building the ship as we're flying, because this is a pretty big undertaking that we, we, we started here. I started with it last April. Um, but with our program, we want to get uh, like Alpha Graphics to come and help our kids design our program that we sell at the games. Uh, Southern Sign Company, they, they've offered to start an internship where a couple of kids can go see how they actually make the signs that we post up and the banners that we post up. So we have some opportunities like that. It's just having the right people uh, who want to come and be a part of that. So, does that answer your question? It does. And there's more opportunity out there, I'm sure, but we just haven't come across it yet. Well, it's good that that dialogue's going on. Yeah. Any more questions for Ryan? Thank you, my Thank friend. You. Thank you, guys. Thanks for your Thank leadership you. in this right. effort. Thank you. I'm sure you're going to yes, get some help from us. Yes, sir. We're uh, fortunate tonight again to have uh, Dr. Smith with us, uh, president of uh, Brunswick Community College, along with uh, Mr. Bland. Uh, the Vice President of Continuing Ed and Economic Development. And uh, so, Dr. Smith, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank y'all so, for inviting me to come out tonight uh, to share with you a little bit about Road uh, Community College. Uh, I do have Greg with me, so we'll be sharing in the presentation. I know Carolina tips off at 7. <laughs> <laughs> and the pants are telling me to keep it short, so I will. <laughs> but uh, uh, but uh, no problem. Um, I am uh, honored to be before you tonight just to tell the story of Brunswick Community College. I don't have time uh, in one session to tell all the things that are going on at Brunswick Community College, but I'll sort of give an overview tonight and then look forward to another opportunity to come back. And Ryan, I'm glad that you're here because you can help me get the word out on a lot of the pieces of my presentation, if you don't mind. So, uh, as uh, over at, uh, at North. so. Uh, I want to start off with a mission because we want to live by our mission every day. The mission of our community college uh, is to provide opportunities for individuals to be successful through accessible, high-quality student-centered programs and services that meet the educational, culture, and workforce needs of a diverse community. And so everything we do, we go back and look at this mission to make sure we are meeting the mission. If it doesn't meet the mission, if it's not student-centered, then we're not going to be a part of it because we, we have limited resources. Uh, we want to make sure that we're putting them where they need to be. And so just to give you an overview, many of you may be aware, but I just wanted to share with you uh, our campus sites. We do have the main campus in Bolivia. I invite you to come by and take a look at what we have. Uh, we have curriculum and continuing education workforce development programs that are going on there. And you'll be uh, glad to know, I think, that the uh, North Carolina Community College system legislative priorities are to support short-term workforce training. That's our number one legislative priority, and we're asking for funding that will allow that to occur. And it would allow for us to earn a, a um, recoup on our FTE that is equal to what we do with curriculum. So whenever Greg in continuing education does a class, let's say a welding class or um, electrical class, those kind of things are as valuable um, as the curriculum class, the history class, as far as allowing us to be reimbursed for what, for what we do to provide more opportunities. That's different than it has been in North Carolina. We also have the Brunswick Interagency Program. It's the only nationally accredited program for intellectually disadvantaged adults. This takes up a whole building on our campus. There's about 120. Greg will tell you a little bit more about it. But if you're having a bad day, I invite you to come over and spend a little time volunteering and your day will be changed. Uh, that we provide um, instruction to students from very low performing all the way up to um, a moderate level. Uh, we, we have students whose IQ are 75 and below in this, in this area, but they have a great heart and are very glad to be there. We also have the Odell Williams Auditorium. I'm sure many of you have been there to see our productions. We're getting our, our uh, 2019 schedule together, and you'll be glad to know that we have nine shows this year instead of the typical eight. Uh, that will also include a children's show on Sunday at, uh, after the Christmas Carol. We're having Frosty the Snowman coming in. 
to try to get a younger crowd coming to Odell Williams Auditorium uh, and be able to experience that very fine location. And we also have the Gore Aquatic and Fitness Center. Uh, two years ago, we had 2,600 members. This year, we have surpassed over 3,000 members that utilize this facility, uh, sometimes on a daily basis. So uh, it's amazing what goes on there. We have uh, um, a swimming pool, therapy pool, uh, the nicest fitness center that uh, I've seen on a, on a community college campus. Uh, and we have a gymnasium, there's pickleball being played, there's men's and women's basketball being played uh, for the adult groups, but we also host our men's and women's basketball teams in that facility. We also have the locker rooms for our men's and women's basketball teams. We also have a yoga room, uh, a lot of different things that are going on there. Classes all day long, every day, except for Sunday. We also have the Betsy Center, the Brunswick Educational Trade Certification Center. Greg's going to tell you a little bit more about that. We have the Southport Center uh, right now. The majority of things that are going on at the Southport Center are heritage arts classes. And so if you like to do uh, ceramics or uh, like to make silversmith jewelry, or uh, jewelry uh, made out of silver, uh, stained glass windows, painting, uh, we're going to be doing glass blowing uh, in the future. Uh, all kinds of things that are going on there. We're having a showcase on the first Friday in May. We invite you to come over and take a look at our students' work and also get an idea about what goes on in there. We also offer some other FTE generating classes like, a medic, uh, uh, like uh, our basic uh, skills and uh, English as a second language and some other things. Some of our uh, emergency, man emergency services classes are going on over there as well. And then the Leland Center, and Greg will tell you a lot more about what going, what's going on here, which is what you all are mostly interested in, I'm sure. The academic programs we have here, I'm not going to go through all of them. I will just highlight a few. These are typically the college transfer programs. In other words, um, if you come to Brunswick, you can get 60 credit hours and transfer to any of the 16 public universities in the UNC system. All credits transfer. We have an articulation agreement with the university system that guarantees that transfer. We also have an articulation agreement with the independent colleges and universities for many of them that allows for all those credits to transfer. And then we have our technical programs. Uh, we have our uh, some of our allied health programs here, our social degree nursing, licensed practical nursing. You know that there's a health care shortage all over North Carolina. We're trying to meet those needs, and I'll tell you a little bit more about some exciting news in just a few minutes. Nursing assistant, lobotomy, uh, all of these over here are also available. If you're interested in cosmetology, uh, we do have a need for uh, folks in the community to come in, get their hair done, their nails done, uh, facials, all kinds of things. Those services are available for a much cheaper rate than what you would have to pay if you went out to a salon. Um, and Greg's wife runs a salon, and I'm sure she, 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 doesn't, she doesn't have quite the, the, the prices that we have, but she's much more trained. Remember, it's students, okay? <laughs> and so your hair uh, will be cut nicely, uh, I'm sure. It's like when I used to get my teeth done at our dental hygiene uh, office at the college I came from, they were as clean as they had ever been because the students were being graded. And so I, it took them a little longer, but they were just as clean as they could ever be. Uh, we have uh, also some of the other programs that you see here. All of these are academic programs. Greg's going to talk to you a little bit about our uh, continuing education workforce development programs. I want to talk to you about the BCC and Brunswick County Schools partnerships. And this is where um, I might can get some help at, at North. We uh, have the Brunswick Early College High School located on our main campus. The county provides uh, the books and the fees, and the state provides the tuition. This is an innovative high school, and we have 100 or less per grade level. I think right now we probably have around 375 students in our early college high school. It's an all awesome opportunity to allow for freshmen to enroll in high school and simultaneously enroll in college. And the goal is for them to complete their associate degree within five years. Many complete their associate degree within four years. And so then they can transfer to the university or go to work 
they transfer to university, they go to the university as a junior at 18 years old. Um, we also, I mentioned the Career College Promise Program when I was here before. The Career College Promise Program, sometimes referred to, or oftentimes referred to as the CCP, or Career College Promise. These are structured opportunities. There are pathways that are aligned in our programs that allow students to take around four classes to get them started toward their social degree. And so high school students are simultaneously enrolled in college courses. The state pays for the tuition in Brunswick County, the county pays for the books and the fees. So it's no cost, it's free college, okay? And uh, it leads to certificates, diplomas, or degrees, and it's available, I uh, should say, to all juniors and seniors. We do have some opportunities for freshmen and sophomore, but if you are an upcoming junior and you have a qualifying GPA, which will be 2.8 in the upcoming year, then you can enroll in these classes. Now, this seems to be a secret throughout all of North Carolina, and especially in Brunswick County. So I'd like to get the word out that high school students can enroll at Brunswick Community College for free while they enroll in high school. Brunswick County Schools provides buses that carry students from the high schools to the college campus twice a day. A group comes in the morning, takes them to the high school, so those kids can take the high school classes in the afternoon, and then the buses come in again in the afternoon to take the kids that were at the high school in the morning to the college and then carries them home in the afternoon. So it's a really good opportunity, and I'm so thankful for the partnership that we have for Brunswick County Schools to allow for this. These are some of the pathways for college transfer, also our career and technical uh, programs, and also some workforce continued education pathways. Right now, these workforce continued education pathways do not allow for articulation for high school credit, but the community college system is working hard to make that happen. So if you go take a welding class, uh, well, that, if you take a welding class at Brunswick, it's a curriculum program, so it will articulate back. But if you take an HVAC class, a heating and air conditioning class, since it's not a curriculum program, it will not articulate back right now. But we still have high school students that enroll in these classes on their own time and get those credentials. Some of the benefits, we've had students take over 69 different courses. They've earned over, this, this is just in 2018, earned over 2,000 uh, hours of college credit, about 150 Brunswick County students and 24 homeschooled and private students. 93.2% of them earned an A, B, or C. That's higher than the other students on our campus. Uh, we do have career coaches at the high schools. These are folks that uh, serve as counselors that help the high school students and their parents learn more about these opportunities. And this is uh, funded by uh, Brunswick uh, Community College, Brunswick County Schools, and is also funded through a grant with the North Carolina Community College System. And then more than, this is a key stat here, more than 354 high school students saved approximately $446,862 in college tuition in just one year through the CCP program. And then we also have the Brunswick Guarantee. The Brunswick Guarantee allows for any high school graduate in Brunswick County, private, homeschool, or any of the other uh, public schools with a, a 2.3 GPA can pursue a degree, diploma, or certificate at no cost. Tuition is paid for, books are paid for, and fees are taken care of by the county. There's no other program like this in the state that I'm aware of. And so this is an awesome opportunity so a high school graduate a high school student can take CCP courses, then continue and get the Brunswick Guarantee, and then transfer to the university if that's their goal, and get a college, uh, a baccalaureate degree without all the debt that most students incur. We also know that some students go through our, 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 our uh, technical programs and can go right to work. I want you to also know that as students are enrolling in these programs, we're beginning to develop a, uh, something that is going to allow even more industry-recognized credentials to be offered for our students. We're, we're becoming a member of the National Coalition of Certification Centers, and this National Coalition of Certification Centers sponsors cer uh, certifications 
that students will get in within the curriculum and then they'll take the test and when they work through the class they'll get those certifications uh, we, we just signed up but at the college I came from we had students that were earning upwards of 20 industry recognized certifications and they're in, a, in a, let's say for example the machining program this is the last dollar scholarship what that means is that students first have to apply for the Pell Grant. If they don't receive the Pell Grant, then they can get the Brunswick Guarantee. Uh, just a few, a little bit of data. In 2017, we had 62 applications. In 2018, we had 83. So we had an increase of 46%. The word is getting out. We awarded 35% increase in scholarships, $135,000 in 17, $256,000 in scholarships in 18. We've increased local high school enrollment. In 2017, 12.4% of the high school graduates came to BCC. In 2018, 21.6%. And our, our friends at North have increased as well. What we're trying to do is help the, the students at North understand these opportunities are available south and not necessarily have to go north to get to get these opportunities at the community college. So uh, we actually have 176 students that are currently taking advantage of the uh, Brunswick Guarantee. We also have several university partnerships. Today, Western Governors University was on our campus. We signed an opportunity, uh, we signed an agreement for students to have the opportunity to seamlessly transfer. On April 1st, uh, UNC Wilmington is coming and we're gonna have a co-enrollment a partnership that will be signed that will guarantee admission to any of our BCC graduates to go to UNCW. Uh, and so that's important because UNCW only admits around 22% of all applicants. But if you're a BCC graduate, you're automatically admitted. UNCW and the other universities realize that when students are successful at the community college, they're also going to be successful at the university. And we are also working with UNC Pembroke and East Carolina University. Just this week, uh, we had a new health science building groundbreaking. Uh, you can see here we had a lot of shovels. A lot of, we had 90 people show up for our groundbreaking. Uh, I was very excited. These are our board of trustees members, our county commissioners, uh, and some of the other uh, folks at the college. Uh, but it's going to be about 26,000 square feet of newly renovated existing space. Uh, will be 12,000 square feet in a new building of 13,750 square feet that's paid for by Connect NC Bond and Brunswick County for a total budget of six million dollars approximately. We hope to have classes starting in there in fall 2020 and these are the programs that will be in this new facility. So we're really excited about that opportunity. We also have athletics on our campus. We have about 60 student athletes right now. We have women's basketball, men's basketball, our men's basketball team had the highest GPA in the last 15 years, 3.1 in the fall. And our baseball team is currently ranked in the top. They're ranked eight, eight nat nationally. Uh, they're currently 14 to one. They don't see good baseball. They usually are, are playing on Saturdays or Sundays um, at home. And then we have a softball team that's coming in the spring of 2020. So uh, I can take questions now, or I can wait till the end, uh, whichever is your pleasure. Anybody have any questions? Well, why not? Yes. Why not? Thanks, we'll like, Greg, go ahead. Well, well, can I, I, I just, I'd like to ask one question about Pembroke for a moment. Yes. Uh, Pembroke has a Thomas Center, which has a phenomenal uh, maker space and things like that. Will your program allow BCC students to be involved in that program as so, well? Them? So, you see Pembroke has something called the Brave Step, and it's a co enrollment program. So, when students are enrolled at BCC, and they know they want to go to UNC Pembroke, UNC Pembroke is going to have them the opportunity to take advantage of opportunities on their campus. Okay. And so there's going to be a, a seamless transition. Now we do have a program on campus that has a 3D printer, but it's, it's not anything elaborate. But my goal as president is to bring some of those type of programs to Brunswick Community College. That takes grant money, it takes space, and so we're trying to develop a strategic plan that will allow for those kind of things to happen at Brunswick Community College. Yeah. Thank you. 
Gene, I was going to say, I, I think a lot of us have questions, but I'd like to hear Greg's presentation. Okay. And then, because the, I have a feeling that he's going to cover some of the things that I have an interest in. Okay, and great. And then, then we'll ask both of you to field questions. Okay. At this time, I'd like to introduce Greg Bland. He's our Interim Vice President of Continuing Education, Economic, and Workforce Development. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. How y'all doing this evening? Great. I got nervous for a minute. Uh, I heard him alluding to my wife's <laughs> hair salon. <laughs> and then he was talking about cosmetology, and I don't know if I need to take take the hint. I can say this about cosmetology because that's where I do go to get my hair cut. I've never lost an ear and they're cheaper than my wife's salon. So, <laughs> that's what I was well, you have a stunning hair, so yeah. <laughs> Nancy, I went in there one morning and the young lady you had some hair to shake it and I said, what, what's wrong with that? I had a suit on. I thought it was the suit. I said, I'm just a person. Don't shake like that. She said, no, you're my first haircut. And I said, don't cut my ears off. But, um, I'm excited about the title, Continuing Education, Economic and Workforce Development. Dr. Sink, you know it wasn't that long ago there was just a vice president for continuing education at these community colleges. And even now today when I'm in the community, people have the misconception that, well, you must just do classes for school teachers that need continuing education credits, and you must do some classes for law enforcement officers that need 12 to 24 hours a year, and you must do a lot of arts and crafts. I can tell you there's a, a national tsunami coming that is identifying this. It's a tsunami of student debt. And I can tell you that in the private sector, no matter how many PhDs or graduate degrees we produce, there's always going to be one administrator, two managers, and seven support staff. I'm thrilled to be in the business of producing the most qualified seven support staff there can be. I think nationally we continue to produce and everybody has a dream, we're going to all be executives, we're all going to get the corner office. It is scary to think that nobody knows how to build the corner office anymore. We all want it. Everybody's going to Harvard, but no one knows how to build anything anymore. In this county, there are 48,000 people in our workforce. That's a fact. It's in my hand from Commerce. 48,000. Guess how many people are in the construction sector that are on the books? 5,000, not enough. 2,000. Guess how many people are flipping burgers? Bigger number. 5,000. We have a problem. How many are fixing cars? <laughs> I'll tell you later. <laughs> Good question. So this is what we do. You can read the slide, but I can tell you who we're trying to serve. We're trying to serve folks that are unemployed. Mom got out of high school, worked at a factory. She loved her job, and that factory moved to Mexico. She worked third shift, and we went there, and we prepared her to transition. We've done that. Mom was unemployed and displaced due to no fault of her own. We're also serving people that are working, and they're ready to take the next rung on the ladder. They're ready for advancement, but they can't because they need a credential. When they got their job, it was okay, but legislation, rules, um, things changed, and so they had to get a third-party credential to get the next step uh, and to get the next pay increase. We're also serving small businesses that need some level of expertise. They need confidential counseling. They need advice. And you know, I'm part of a small business. I'm also part of the college, but I can tell you, I don't know everything. April Scott doesn't know everything, but you can see the college knows how to collaborate. If we don't know something, we will tell you and we'll get you the resources that you need. The final uh, group of folks that we're supporting is we're working with towns, municipalities, and our county, just in case there's a company business and industry that wants to come here and we want to help attract them. No one can talk about workforce training like we can. So we want to be right there with that municipality, hand in hand, when they're talking to that company. We can help. So in the non-credit area that I oversee, we serve 4,000 people in 2018 through community service, economic development, foundational studies, public health and safety, and workforce development. And just to clarify, public health and safety, that is EMS, basic, intermediate, advanced, like paramedic. Uh, that's uh, in-service law enforcement training and courses offered through the Office of State Fire Marshal. We have about 22 OSFM credentials at the college. Uh, so in terms of career pathways, it's not just one course anymore that we're trying to offer people and say goodbye. Now, there will always be a need for that if somebody needs to be a notary. But in terms of a career pathway, if you want to take HVAC and become a technician, you need the course that focuses on residential, and you need the course that focuses on commercial. 
in electrical, there's electrical technician one, electrical technician two, and there's also the licensure prep course. So you see the pathway experience that we're creating? Mm -hmm. So these are some of our pathways. Now, uh, President Smith alluded to some of our centers, and he asked me to speak on Leland and the Betsy. So I'll start with Leland. Leland is uh, our hub for CNC training, PLC courses, electrical technician. It has our incubator and our synergy co working space. The Betsy, that's where our college began. It's in supply. It's a small cinder, bl cinder block building. I think the college started in 1979 with about $8,000. <coughs> we kept the building, it's still there. And it houses mostly administrative staff. We do offer courses on HRD there, on how to improve your resume and get a job. It's nothing fabulous, you're welcome to see it. But if you go through a credential course and you file your paperwork for NCCER and you're in construction, you need someone to help you with that paperwork. Or if you're a firefighter and you need your credential. So we have folks at the Betsy that do nothing but administrative tasks getting students credentials. Community service. So not only do we want to make sure that we have a community that's in the pipeline for the private sector, we also want to make sure that we are balanced and we have uh, fun opportunities. Folks move here for the environment. Folks move here for the pace of life. And so we want to have that right pace of life. And that's painting, guitar, sound recording, French, Latin, French for travelers, uh, law for laymen, sub suddenly single, how to invest if something happens. Uh, jewelry making, uh, fiction writers workshop, coastal heritage, uh, genealogy, and the list goes on. Those are the personal enrichment courses that are more traditionally associated with continuing it. Economic development, we have a business incubator, we do customized training, small business center counseling, and synergy with a small business center. Uh, we probably offer well over 100 small business center workshops every year. Uh, April sees between 15 and 20 new business startups, and uh, we're really proud of her efforts. With the incubator, uh, you know, in, in Brunswick County, 3,800 people identify as self-employed. So that's a pretty big demographic when you look at the 48,000 people that are actually working in the county. And we believe that the first few years of a small business are very critical. If we can help them with facility costs and startup costs and give them counseling and allow them to experience a network of resources, I think it'll ensure their viability for the long term. Foundational studies is another program. And you know, when you're in the community college world, there's three legs on the stool. There's curriculum, there's non-credit workforce, and there's foundational studies. And this, in a nutshell, is GED, adult high school, and English as a second language. These are folks that maybe they had a parent that was sick Maybe they had to go to work early on in life, or maybe they made a mistake. But we want to take these folks and bridge them right into curriculum programs or right into um, uh, non-credit courses. Uh, I can say that in the, the world of community colleges within foundational studies, we're probably ranked 21st out of 28 in terms of size, and we have between 50 and 75 graduates a year. Uh, I think we've touched on uh, emergency and health services. Uh, we have good working relationships and clinical experiences with assisted livings with New Hanover Regional Medical Center and with Novant. I will tell you as a whole, the college is known for nursing. For the last 10 years, uh, the college has had a 100% pass rate, first time test taker pass rate on the state exam. So when we pass a student in nursing in BCC, they go all the way. How does that compare to the university passage, passing rate? You know? I know you're a lot better. I just wonder if you knew the number. I, I can't say, but I, I would off the cuff say that we, we, we lead the community college at 58. We're probably tied with maybe one or two others. And I know we're a little better than the university, but we have smaller class sizes. I think we have that advantage. I don't want to criticize them, but we, we've got the edge. These are some of the third party credentials that are uh, offered through BCC and recognized nationally. Get a question about CompTIA, that's computer repair CompTIA. I get that a lot when people see that. NIMS, National Institute for Metal Working Skills, NCCER is the National Center for Construction, Education, and Research. A number of grants, the NC Back to Work grant, paid registration fees for students to get into the classroom and earn credentials. Uh, New Generations was a very similar grant. Um, the Business Incubator, I hope you've had an opportunity to see that. If you've had it, I'll take you there. Uh, 
uh, Duke Energy providing machine technology equipment. Uh, North Carolina Community College System recently allowed us to upgrade our patient care technician program. Medical assisting is now patient care technician. Um, and our newest initiative, uh, on October 31st, the governor announced the innovation grant. Uh, he had three $100,000 grants that were planning grants for regions and workforce boards and colleges so that they could implement an innovative training program. He also had three $400,000 grants for implementation of such. So uh, I think on November 30th, we submitted our RS, our, our, we submitted for the RFP and we applied for the uh, implementation grant of 400,000. So two weeks ago, we were awarded that. We went and met with the governor. Uh, Ginger Brig at the Workforce Development Board has received the $400,000. Their board just needs to vote on it and then we'll begin workforce training. Because we're a certified, we're certified in construction in this region, our grant is all about construction. When you look at the construction needs in the county, the growth, uh, hurricane damage, I can tell you that sector is really suffering. Uh, I think it's the backbone of our area. No one's gonna move here if they can't get good housing. No one's gonna put a business here if there's no one here to build it. And um, I think the folks that are here that are disconnected or, or uh, unemployed and, and maybe lacking social capital and they don't have the connections, we wanna be able to take the grant dollars and go out and recruit them wherever they are, whether it be a fire department, a community center in Nevada, wherever we can get to, we wanna recruit them and offer these construction courses as close to their home as we can get. And then link them to work-based learning experiences with the Brunswick County, Brunswick County Home Builders Association. That's my information. Thank you. All right, sure. questions? Bruce Smith. Sure. We'll start. Steve had a question first. Okay. Steve. Dr. Smith first, but then I have one for you too, Greg. Okay. Uh, you mentioned the, uh, the uh, career, uh, career coaches. Co no, career, career coaches. coaches. Yes. So, could you tell me a little bit more about that? Are they, uh, are they employed educators or are they volunteers or are they from the business community? How does that program work? Uh, the two that we have, uh, one is a, um, she used to be a high school assistant principal and the other one used to be a high school English instructor. And so they know how the inner workings of the high school are and how, uh, how to reach our students. So uh, one uh, goes to, I think, north and west and the other one goes to south and the coast and um, they're housed on the campus and they are just like a counselor, but they're promoting Brunswick Community College or other college opportunities in North Carolina. So they are our number one contact for all the high school students in the county. Uh, we have something called the, uh, the CCP showcases. So a couple of weeks ago, we were out at the high schools in the evening, invited the parents in, they came in and we would tell them uh, a longer version of my CCP presentation there, which included how to register and all those kind of things. And if you'll take a look at this brochure that I shared with you, um, there's a list of all of our programs that we have. And whenever you see this uh, CP, those are the career and college promise opportunities for our high school students to give them a jump start. So as you see there, they're very, they're, you know, almost every program has a, a career and college promise pathway. Uh, is what it's called, and they typically are 12 semester hours, typically three uh, or four classes, four three-hour classes, and then when and uh, that, but they can take more than that, so they can complete a pathway and then take additional courses, or they can actually take two different pathways. I'll give you a personal example. My two children were involved in Career College Promise in the county from which I just came. My daughter earned 27 credit hours while in high school at Wayne Community College when she got to East Carolina, that saved me $25,000. When my son, who is a senior now, he will have 33 credit hours if he goes this summer. He will have 30 if he does not. He, he, may, he may get a break this summer. But he will have 30. 30 is gonna save my wife and I a tremendous amount of money as he goes to the university. And so, uh, but if they're going to the community college, he would be halfway through the associate degree before he got out of high school. So it's a wonderful opportunity. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One last question. You know. Ray, you, uh, the last portion of your presentation was talking about the reach out programs. We have a uh, certain cohort of uh, post-military veterans, young veterans that are seeking or could, 
should be seeking other other employment and opportunities to gain better employment. How does the, how do those veterans work into that reach out? <laughs> so pathways to purpose is the grant funding that we have for construction. Okay. And that's where we're going to have a recruiter going out <clears throat> and finding pockets of folks that maybe want to get into the construction field. And when I can't, when I say construction, what I mean is electrical, hmm. carpentry, plumbing, or HVAC. Right. That's the specifics of the grant. I would love that before that before we get an approval on the money from the Cape Fear Board, we've already been awarded, it's in their account. Before that happens, I'd love to meet them. Like tomorrow. It would be great. We will definitely do that. Um, I think uh, it's probably important for us to set the stage. We have applications already created so folks can jump in the boat when we're, and then when the light turns green, we can begin teaching and spending the money. And the money will pay their registration fee, it'll pay for their books, it'll pay for transportation, it'll even pay for the third party testing costs for their credential. Do you know if you're, the organizations locally that service the veterans, are they aware of this program? No. Should they be? This is the first formal presentation I've given. Okay. Thank you. And they will be made known. Yeah. The, Dr. Smith, yes, um, you alluded to earlier that you said that the uh, Career College Promise and the Brunswick Guarantee were two of the best kept secrets around, and they're not going to continue to be. Why do you think, or what are your hunches about why they have not been well known, and what you plan to make them more well, well known? Well, it's a continual moving target. You know, as we talk to the juniors and seniors now, Next year we've got sophomores and freshmen. So what? And and then the next year that group's gone, and we got to continually get the word out. And so what I'm what I'm hoping is that as I share with you all, you all will know people who qualify, and you'll get the word out. And then we'll, you'll continue to be able to share it in the community. So it's <coughs> not a secret. Uh, when I when I say it's a secret, we we only have. 21 percent of the high school students that are taking advantage of this body of this now i know that 100 percent is not going to happen but imagine if 50 percent of the high school students in brunswick county were taking college courses uh with for free tuition uh, what impact that would make now it's going to um there are college classes they are rigorous and so whenever i give a presentation about ccp I remind students that it is a college course. If you don't pass, it will impact your chance to get financial aid when you actually graduate high school. So you gotta take it serious and take the number of courses that you can manage. Some students could take one, some could take two. My son's taking three this fall. I'm pushing him a little, or this spring, I'm pushing him a little bit harder. He only had one English class to graduate. Wasn't gonna let him sit at home and do nothing. So he's taking three college classes, which is, which is, uh, and he's, but I talk to his friends that come to my house, and I say, uh, do you know about CCP? No, I don't know about it. Why? And just one follow up. Doug, let me just jump in too. I've got a, a daughter, Chloe. She's a, a junior at West Brunswick High School. What Dr. Smith just said was, you know, you start small and then if they do okay, that's exactly what's happened with Chloe. She took uh, an English level, uh, college level English, last semester she did okay now she's taken two courses i think one of them is psychology and the other one is um math she's going to be okay and she's got confidence that she can do college level work now she didn't have that before so it's a savings but it's a confidence booster and i met with dr Rooks the second day i was on the job at, at bcc and i said dr Rooks, what can you and i work on together he says i want to promote ccp i stood up and high-fived it uh, <laughs> because if, if he and i can work together to get the word out then that's going to be a plus for everybody. And are so there, I'm excited about his willingness to work with us. Are there other venues besides word of mouth that yes, we uh, to get the word out about well, these two uh, important we, programs? We have um, we have billboards. We have our, our website. We are well, whenever I'm going out, I'm I'm talking about it. Whenever Greg's going out, he's talking about it. We have our career coaches. Uh, we're uh, we're just exploring a way. Uh, this morning uh, for a device to help get text messages out to high school students. Uh, and so, you know, there's a specific program that will allow that to happen. And I've got to get Dr. Oaks to help me uh, to allow that to happen. And it's a reminder about, hey, we got registration coming up next week. Hey, uh, this is how you get onto your Moodle. So it's not only just a reminder, but it's also a, support, a wraparound support mechanism for our students. Those signs are strategically placed. When you leave West Brunswick High School, the sign is there across the road staring at you every time you leave. So I think there's there's a, 
there's some magic in what we do with the signs, and I think we also may have some digital ads. Chris? Dr. Smith, thank you, thank you, Mr. Joe. Are we, I don't want to sound the wrong way, but are we at the right place by trying to address this with a freshman in high school? By that time, there's a lot of things that's gone on. Should we be looking at the middle school kids and starting to educate them as well as the parents and yes. getting them to start to look at grade point averages and the thing that's, things that they're going to need to get into the CCP program and continue on? You make a great point. So. Um, in, in the 60 days I've been here, we've been, and, and I know Tim Payne does a great job. If you look at the data, we have increased the number of students uh, by 86% in just the last year. Uh, we, uh, we have 100 and, I think it's 150 plus students right now. Just a couple of years ago, we had 40 something. So uh, what, we're, what we're trying to do is to get the high school people taken care of, and then go to some of the career fairs for the middle school, get the word out at the middle school, because that's when people are sort of making, some kids make up their mind what they want to do in the seventh and eighth grade. You know, Michael Norton is on our board, and he said he learned he wanted to become an engineer when they had a career day at his middle school. And he didn't change his mind. And so if we can get in front of those middle school students and help them be aware, then we'll be doing that as well. And efforts have begun. I saw this in President Smith's hand when he walked in the door. He's given this to you. Our foundation has two programs, women in philanthropy and men in philanthropy. And those programs target middle school kids that could be at risk. So just last week, we were in middle schools talking to kids that we believe might need to know about our opportunities. Now we're talking about a lot more than that. We're talking about life. We're talking about values and we're talking about role models and risks that you take and safety. But it is in middle school, they develop a too cool for school mentality. And that's, that's early intervention is how we'll change it. So we've begun a little bit. Dr. Smith, I find your words very encouraging and refreshing. And as a second wave back in the day, community college president, when public schools wouldn't even talk to us because they were jealous of community colleges taking funds away from public schools, you, sir, have made great strides. And I'm so very much encouraged to see uh, how this is going to help us with economic development especially some comments that, uh, that you made about working with the Department of Commerce, uh, and, and I hope you still go out with them as they recruit industry into North Carolina and talk about new and expanding industry and workforce development, because I think that's the biggest key, or the, the biggest carrot that uh, uh, the state can dangle uh, before uh, industry comes here is that workforce <coughs> training that you can provide for them. So that's very encouraging. Was there another hand down this way? Uh, Michael. Mr. Glenn, I have a question. So that last piece you just commented on with regards to the grant, with all of the new construction that's going to be taking place with the school bond, as well as the uh, recent grant that was for the new health sciences building, is there an opportunity to do a parallel program with what you just received for that grant to do some on-site training with all of those construction projects that will be taking place in the education system itself? Yes, but in order to do so, we would have to have work-based learning agreements with the contractors. Okay. Those have to be with private sector folks. And so we could run any number of work-based learning agreements at the 40th hour of a lecture course. Mm -hmm. Just think of a traditional construction course. Mm -hmm. At the 40th hour, when we think they have the basics, they can, they can go off-site with an agreement with a, with a contractor. And they can spend up to 192 hours there unpaid. It, you can look at it as a, as a long-term interview. Mm -hmm. What we're required to do is make sure we have student learning objectives in that contract and that visitation is occurring regularly. Okay. So the answer is a firm yes. But what, the, the, that private party would have to be, that, that contractor would have to be in agreement with doing That's right. Wanting to do that. That's right. We, as the educational provider, cannot also be the work-based learning provider. That would be inappropriate. Could you make that a part of the RFP process? If there are on any future projects that if as a part of the RFP, the contract company with a lot X amount of students? That typically is, is uh, our process has to be passed by the state construction office. That typically is not done, but there's enough opportunity uh, in projects uh, off campus. But if Monteith is doing our construction and they were a work-based learning uh, partner, 
then they may actually indeed have students on that project. Oh, okay. But, but uh, right now, we're breaking ground on the 25th, and uh, I doubt that we'll have um, those agreements with Monty by before it's over. It's like I told Greg this morning. If you're going to build a snowman, you got to start with a snowball, and hopefully the sure. snowball's wet and sure. heavy. And so you roll it, and you get enough to build the base, and then pretty soon you have a snowman. Right now, we're, we're building the snowball, and we want to generate enough interest in this through this grant to develop uh, through our CWD, perhaps curriculum programs with construction trades that will then serve the community for years to come. This is a two-year grant. The goal is 60 in the first year, 60 in the second year, but I'm hoping to exceed that and provide the same kind of services through our foundation with, through scholarships and that kind of thing. That would be remarkable. And then that would lead to more, uh, it'll let, lead to momentum for us to get additional grants in the future. If we demonstrate success, then we can show that in our next RFP for a grant. That makes sense. Point, point taken, and the plant, the seed is planted. Uh, I, th I, I think it's a great. I think it's great to achieve that grant. So that's fantastic news. Well. And we do thank the construction. Uh, correct. Thank, thank you. Bruce had a question. I've just got two quick ones. One for Dr. Smith. I would assume the quickest sell within a family unit are the current students who have brothers and sisters who are freshmen and sophomores, right? Because yes. there's a trend set associated with that. Do you have statistics that show that the growth has included? common family units where you're seeing it stay within the family that a brother and sister who has maybe gone on on the program over the course of the last two or three years it's just anecdotal data right now but uh, and, and, uh but but no I, we don't have it at that level but it's it's interesting that you say that because i know that my son knew about it because he saw his sister doing it right. and he knew that the expectation was he didn't have a choice you know he knew the expectation was that he's going to be in it and that happens at the at the, at the uh in the households, you know, just last uh, two weeks ago, we had 21 uh, parental groups come to North for our presentation. I was convinced when we left, all 21 were going to sign up. But I need those 21 to tell 21 friends. So I was standing at the door, and as I was shaking their hand, thanking them for being there, I said, "Tell all your friends about this," and I hand them an extra brochure. I mean, they're your sales reps. Yes. yes. I'll they're tell you. I'll tell you what is shocking is looking at how well BCC students do at the four-year level. Uh, we had some data this morning that blew my mind. Yeah, and it's and, amazing. And what, and what I need to share with you all as well is that uh, BCC uh, is uh, evaluated by the state every year on performance measures. And Brunswick Community College is the highest performing community college in the state if you look at the overall performance of our college. There's four measures that we meet at the highest level and two that we meet at the uh, above average level. And so there's not another community college that has those performance measures uh, levels as we did this past year. And so I'm, uh, when I was at the other college, I was looking, the first thing I did, I went down to my college and looked, and then I knew that I had the job, uh, or I was applying for the job here, same thing as I looked there. And then when I got the job, every time they brought it up, I sort of giggled out loud because they knew I was coming here and I knew I was coming here so it's a great college and so we have uh, quality at our college that we need the community and others to, to uh, take advantage of. I have a very specific question. I have one more. If, if, uh, uh, if we have a need in this community for uh, automotive technology, are you prohibited from offering that program either uh, either continuing ed or through applied technology programs because uh, Kate Fear has the program already? If we ha if we uh, want to offer a program, then we will submit. If we want to have the program, we will submit the program application. We send it out to all the other colleges that have programs. And they can say, we do not support you having the program because you will take away students from our service area. Um, if we submit one of those, I'm prepared to fight for Brunswick Community College. Not fight literally, but I think there's a big enough need in our county for those kind of programs. There's enough students to go around. And so uh, regarding automotive technician, uh, Dr. Oates and I have had some preliminary discussion about that kind of program whereby high school students could get some training and then be part of a CCT program and then maybe in the evening 
we could offer it for the adult students who might want to take advantage. But that's just in the preliminary uh, discussions, but it is part of something we've been talking about. Well, as a small business owner, I'm going to continue to keep screaming because mm -hmm. the need is there. Okay. Well, we'll take we'll, one more question we'll need and then we will... Uh, uh, I just want one quick update because you didn't mention welding. Sure. Uh, with regard to Leland nor the advanced uh, programs. Okay. Because I mean, we have selfishly a vested interest in both of those. That's no problem at all. So welding remains on the main campus. Um, we have CCP welding for high school kids. We have uh, certificate welding on the four credit side. And then in the evenings, we had uh, non-credit welding for third party credentials. Do you have any idea of the population? Um, just rough numbers. No problem. I was there yesterday. We're revising and redoing the shop. I saw nine students working while I was there, but that's only one section that I was in. So overall, I'd say we usually have a waiting list and it's full. Um, I think we have uh, around 25 students right now in welding. Uh, one of the first spaces I walked through when I came on my tour was welding, and I, um, we had the opportunity there to improve that space. And so our instructor is working on cleaning it. I'm going to be asking for help to do power washing, painting, a facelift. Uh, we, we're exploring new welding equipment. Um, and also, if you've been to our campus in the D building, there's welding, there's HVAC, there's carpentry, there's three bays there. And so, uh, as a student, I want a person to come in, a student to come in and say, this is where I want to go to school. So I wanted to look, you know, when I drove into this building, mm -hmm. this is a nice facility. People want to be here. Uh, I want our spaces to look similar. Uh, and I realized that that, uh, that that is maybe a, a tall ask, but I'm going to ask for what we need. And so if we give it a facelift, have good uh, equipment, quality instructors, and provide those credentials so that they can go to work as soon as they get through with a class or when they get through with a degree, then that's what we're supposed to be about. And so uh, I've, I've been involved with those kind of programs in the past, and we have those mm -hmm. programs on our campus now, but in some of our uh, trades areas, some of our technical areas, we need to step up our game a little bit. Our okay. city council, there was, there was a second his hand up. question. I think we've got uh, be the last question, uh, Mr. Callahan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you, you've presented a lot of programs and a lot of opportunities. I'm, I'm going to point to some key things that you said. Okay. Uh, you talked about uh, adult students. You talked about intellectually disadvantaged adults, moms displaced, um, workforce training, GED school programs, at-risk kids. I heard you say a wraparound concept. What would you think about an on-campus housing village to meet some of those needs in the community? dealing with housing. Would you be interested in hearing more about that and including that in, the, in your strategic plan as you begin to develop? I would be interested in listening to that, but with on-campus housing comes a plethora of issues uh, and additional staff to support that housing. Sure. Sure. And so um, right, that right now, we, we're not even close. We, we, uh, we've got a lot more priorities than have on-campus housing right at this moment. Understand but in yes. terms of your strategic plan down the road. I, I would I would be willing to listen to the plan, and, sure. and uh, that's that, that's going to require a lot more resources than we currently have. Understand. Thank you, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. Well done. I think it's appropriate that we have an update on the food truck rodeo. <laughs> Why don't you jump in and give us the details? Um, it's still planned for next Saturday, March 23rd, noon to 5 at Park Park Press Street. Um, we've got, we're maxed out with food trucks and vendors scheduled. We still have the direct TV truck showing March Madness games, live music all day. So it's going to be wonderful. We do have the addition this year of Edward Teach Brewery coming in, along with Noni Box Winery. So. What are the hours? Noon to five. Noon to five. Yes. <clears throat> update on the innovation part. Gary? Mr. Chairman, I really don't have any updates. Uh, there's a lot of work going on in the background right now. Uh, that'll lead up to our next board meeting in a month or so. 
good on, but I'm really good on Thank you. Let's go to uh, John, sir, McCloskey. Let's get to work. <laughs> you might recall about two months ago, I put on a presentation about the strategic plan for the Wilmington Court mm -hmm. so that we could try to find areas of cooperation with them. Um, I saw something pretty amazing last week that I'll share with you. One of the post Panamax freighters, the 1150 footers, went by my house as I was driving in the driveway. I couldn't get a picture because he was gone by the time I got there. But the back of that vessel looked like somebody had taken a game of dominoes and thrown them on a table. All of the containers were like this, and one of the containers was actually hanging off the stern, held by some sort of a cable. I don't know what it was, but my first reaction was, why is this guy going into Wilmington with this tremendous damage that he's got? And it's going to be dangerous as hell to fix the problem he had. It's got to be that turnaround time. Uh, I thought to myself, with that kind of damage, you ought to be going to Charleston or Norfolk, even though he was scheduled for a moment. And obviously, he had some 60-foot seas or something to cause that vessel to turn like that. So I think that's a tribute to the court, that people have the confidence in them to be able to right a situation that was as wrong and dangerous as that was. Credit to them. <clears throat> OK. <clears throat> We're going to start now with the ugly part. And that's who's going to do what and by when. All right, so I'm going to oh, don't go away. I do need a copy of your presentation. And I'll say again what I said the last time. I wish I had heard this stuff 10 years ago. It would have made a difference to a lot of people. All right, do you mind helping me? Since you don't need the board, then I don't think you're not going to write on the board. No, no. Got to be taking notes. So what we're going to talk about now are the action items to support the four strategic objectives. Each page has a, the strategic objective as the headline, and then all of the things that we've talked about, the action items to support it, are then listed. What we need now is who's going to be the person primarily responsible, and when can you deliver the goods. That's pretty plumb, isn't it? So we talked about a trifold brochure, which would highlight all of the things that are great about Leland. And the message there was that we not only need to get them into uh, one of those two. The rack parts. The what? The racks. No, no. The uh, visitor center visitor is what centers. you mentioned. Mm -hmm. We need to get these into all the hotel lobbies as well, because they all have those racks where people that are visiting, you know, pick stuff up. People need things to do when they're in a hotel. Are you talking about visiting centers all over the state? No, I'm talking them? about hotel lobbies yeah. up and down the coastline. From I'm talking about from Myrtle Beach to perhaps Jacksonville. There must be a hundred hotels. Yes. Somebody's got to do all that work. First of all, we've got to print all those brochures and have a fund with you know, the money to do it. It shouldn't be a lot. But if we could get five or ten of those trifolds into every one of those hotels, um, I think that's how we get the word out to people that come visit, come visit Leland, the home of the, we'll call it the home of the USS North Carolina. It's a bit of a lie, but good advertising. It's a pleasure to us as well. Probably true. Sure. So, so is it still a good thing to do? Yeah, it's it's already in progress. Okay. Um, so the TDA is working on this very thing. Um, we had a brochure before. We're just updating it with the current branding. Um, okay. And we do have a tagline, and it's "Life is good here." Is our, our tourism development authority visit Leland? Life is good here. That's trademark. Um, so that we can put a check mark next to it as in progress. Um, and that will be distributed to the um, welcome centers along the highways throughout the state. Um, and then also RDU Airport um, and our local hotels. But we'll make your note to, to distribute it at, to more hotels along okay. the area, the 17 corridor. When do you think we might have that done? Just um, give me a rough guess in a month. Um, we're in March right now, May. How about you? June. <laughs> OK. So. 
There was a suggestion that Leland might participate in the July 4th festival, perhaps some sort of a small club. Um, the word there is that there are 50,000 visitors at this festival and all sorts of television coverage. This is South Fork. Yeah. Um, you know, you might be able to put together a decent looking club for 500,000 bucks, but I think the advertising that you get <laughs> might be really worth your time. I can cross it off the list. You know, got to say yes or no, Mr. Chairman. I think it's a good idea. <laughs> um, I absolutely think it would be a fantastic idea um, for uh, certain projects. Um, for for the tourism, Southport isn't really a market that we we spend money or, or visit for tourism. You know, people might like yourself might come and, and have a meal perhaps, but not really stay overnight and. and you know, be a, a typical tourist right. that we want to draw. Of the 50,000 attendees, I'll bet you that 47,500 are not residents of right. the South Fork. Right, yeah. right. Um, I think right now, as far as the, the TDA is concerned, I don't know if it would be feasible to put together a float, but I'll absolutely recommend it to them. I think it would be a good year. idea. Yeah, next year. Or, like we mentioned, the, the North Carolina Rice Festival, if they could get something together in that time um, after they, they form themselves. And I think that might be a good opportunity as well. Yeah. John, any uh, civic clubs that are floats? Again, please. Any civic clubs, such as uh, Rotary mm -hmm. or Lions or Kiwanis, do they have floats in this parade? Yeah, they do. Uh, I don't know whether every one of them does, but you've got those, uh, what do they call the guys that run around on those little cars? Shriners. 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 Yeah, they're always there. Just um, I personally them. don't go because I can't stand the crowd. I just get in my house with a bottle of wine and say, call me when you're done. <laughs> it's brutal downtown. Well, I've been there. I agree. It can be hot sometimes, too. On July 4th? Really? But I was just thinking in terms of promoting Leland, there could be a collaborative effort with some of the nonprofits or the civic clubs, have civic clubs. Mm -hmm. So what about the Rotary in Leland? Could you do something in connection with that? Yeah. Careful now. Mm -hmm. Yes, the answer to that is yes. Well, you might be careful. Well, you, you're talking about work. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> I mean, something, something like the 2020 rollout for the Rice Festival has an association with that broad exposure, and, and so mm -hmm. it's not separate. I mean, there's certain things here. That I particularly like the combination with the Rice Festival, right? Because the yeah. Clientele you would draw are pretty much the same crowd. You know, like These people are not coming in from Hickory, North Carolina, to see the Fourth of July fireworks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's actually a really good idea, Bruce. To so do a visit, Leland Life is good here. Float, coming, and then coming twenty twenty. Coming twenty twenty, and then the float is designed around twenty twenty Rice Festival. Yeah. Yeah. It'll draw attention. It'll get. It'll we be can talk about. That's a great idea. Who, who could help with that? Would that be something to... Well, the, the North Carolina Rice Festival right now is in the process of forming itself as an organization. Um, and so we're ready to have our first uh, board meeting on the 26th of this month. And so right now, the unit is just starting out. So um, trying to get something together for July 4th would be ambitious um, oh, no, for a no. brand new let's, group. Let's target it next year. Yeah. Next but, year. but rolling out, like announcing the, the North Carolina Rice Festival, with it, you know, I... I we could try. It depends on the board. We have three members. You get a board member. Yeah, I know. We have three members, so I'm looking around. Look, there are three names. Let's try it. Put in your mind. How about if we just settle with, how about we settle with a car, with a, with a magnet on the side that says coming soon? <laughs> The toss rice. That would be fine. Yeah. So, that, that's part of the conversation we should have. Yeah. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be a full fledged float, but we can, right. we can some way to make publicity. Well, in those cases, those floats are already pre made. I mean, you basically are just renting the pre made float, and then you just go and put our whatever the logos are and stuff like that. So okay. you're not actually building the trailer and then building the float. It's there's there's look. I like the idea more now. Yeah. <laughs> but that, but that sounds doable. Yeah. This Fourth of July. That's us. Awesome. If they have room, so we'll inquire about that. And I'll bring it up to the the North Carolina <clears throat> Festival Board. So who's the responsible person for that? Jackie. That would be me. <laughs> <laughs> This whole page, exactly. the whole page. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. So the food truck reveal, I heard you say, is March 23rd. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Look at the long way. All right. No. Covers the 
Mr. Page President. one. Remember, we're shooting here for an April 11th presentation to Gary with a rough cut of the whole strategic plan. You skipped um, Public Service TV ads. Yeah, how about that? Thank you. I'm not wearing my glasses. That's a big problem. Where's the food truck rodeo going to be given away? Again, now? Where? Um, the park right across the street. Yeah, that's right. We live in this little park. To, yeah, to the um, I'll, I'll contribute for the, the TV ads. Um, so public service announcements um, often are filling unsold inventory with television stations, but they're typically for you know, public safety type or public awareness types of, of um, messages. So we've participated, the town has participated with the police department for like child safety, um, things like that. But for events, I don't know, we have a work partnered with um, one of our local TV stations for our um, Christmas festival and parade. Um, and they were our media partner and helped to publicize that quite a bit. Um, but that was here in our local market. So I look at uh, occasionally a Spectrum channel, I believe it's <coughs> mm -hmm. I'm not sure, but I think it's 12. And they normally have scrolling banners across the bottom, and I've seen mm -hmm. things like the King Mackerel Tournament, yeah. the big tournament up in Moore, had various civic events going across there. I would mm -hmm. imagine it's free or very close to free. Yeah, their neighborhood calendars are on That's most, what it's called. Mm -hmm, most of the TV stations um, and their websites have neighborhood calendars. And I know our Parks and Rec staff um, really tries to get onto all of those, but we can double check that list and make sure they're getting them all of them. I mean, places like WWAY, they do local interest mm -hmm. segments, like yes. the 15 and minute mm -hmm. ones. They're nice, short, quick, 30 minute, two events, that kind of thing. That yeah. would be a target. Absolutely. And we work very well with them. Um, they've been a really good partner for the town so far. Um, and that's another for the, the North Carolina Rice Festival. They've um, committed support to that. There's a TV show on Sunday morning with the, uh, the clerk of the courts in Brunswick County. His last name is McCallum. Mm -hmm. um, he does that. I've been on with him a couple of times. You'd be wonderful putting on a 10 or 15 minute, I'm serious, 10 or 15 minute segment with them. And it's free. We'll reach out to them. Okay. That's through 18C. Yes, it is. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you won't be bored before you go. That's right. We'll let me know before you go. Yeah. <laughs> like two weeks. All right. The second strategic development was get the news out about the potential for Leland as a retirement community. And the word here is mostly outreach. but. When we had our discussions, we discovered that the local land developers are already spending gazillions of dollars on that doing the work for us. And mm -hmm. I guess when things are doing going well, you just keep your hands off. We'd be a support player, but uh, not a proactive doer, not a competitor. So the big one here was how do we tap in to the local financial base uh, to form a legal and investors club? The responsibility and the timing for the first one is nobody and never. So. <laughs> can, I, can I ask a question? I mean, is this designed as volunteers go? I got two more months on this board. Um, can I continue oh, in sure. some capacity in sure. one of these categories? Yeah, yeah. We, we hope to begin engaging folks from outside. Okay. We're well, that's fine. To, I just didn't want to fulfill to all these goals. goals. Yeah. And you can say book. I have the same book. So the action item for the Cleveland Financial Club. Well, I'd like to be involved in some capacity, but I have no idea right now. Like you said, you know, yeah. it's a shotgun approach right now. Okay. It needs to be something a little more refined. So, Sorry. John, I think this is maybe where the opportunity zones may come into play. If we do a panel session and presentation, as we're hoping, yeah. Mm -hmm. We reach out to the retirement community, the folks that you know have some pretty, pretty significant assets to to attend because they can become potential investors in these opportunity zones. Does the group know about the opportunity zones? Uh, we're going to talk about that at our next meeting. Okay. Yeah. So would that would you include the money managers in town? Yes. So we'd be including developers. Uh, financial advisors, tax accountants, tax attorneys. Uh, this is an IRS program that was introduced a year or so ago yeah. uh, to focus on low-income neighborhoods. And um, Mr. 
Mr. Braddock, myself, and uh, PK Doherty are doing our homework to learn more about these opportunity zones before in a position to present that to this committee, and we hope to do that in a minute. But we qualify. So there's a large portion of Leland that is in an opportunity zone. Essentially, everything on this side of 7476 between the interchange and Montpisery Road, um, all the way to the Nevada border, or uh, Nevada border, uh, is in an opportunity zone. So, to your point, on March 11th, there was an editorial in the Star News about opportunity zones and uh, Let's not let it just be another tax loophole. Yeah. But uh, the fact you're on top of it is encouraging to leave. So that could be an opportunity it is to invite a great opportunity to coordinate local investment. Absolutely. To the, you know, the short course is if you invest and keep your money in it for 10 years, all your capital gains are tax free. Yeah. That's the short course. Mm -hmm. Right, folks, we're rolling along. Great alliances to promote agriculture. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Didn't we not say that we were going to try to meet with an expert on forming a club? Somebody in Raleigh or Charlotte? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right. There was there's someone. There was the brand. Who was it? The Dr. Sink, I think. Dr. Sink knew someone. I spoke to the uh, such a club that's uh, part of the uh, Carolina Club on the campus of UNC Chapel Hill. Sure. Uh, but basically, they were telling me it's just a, uh, uh, it's a <clears throat> country club membership where they invite their members to come in and, and talk about uh, entrepreneur opportunities. There's not uh, an expert, per se, that drives that force. It's just you're a member of this dinner club, uh, and you're invited to make a presentation if, you, if you're looking for investors. And that's... That's the best I could come away with. I talked to the manager of the Carolina Club, and I talked to a staff person, and it's just they send out an announcement, come and speak if you want to. What would you think, I'll ask you both, if we could outreach to the Leland community? How would we outreach to the Leland community? What's the communication <clears throat> mechanism to let them know about this opportunity? Opportunity zone? Well, I, I think when we are uh, talking about the Gary meeting with the uh, financial uh, situation, the financial advisors uh, in the area, we uh, spread the word to them about is there an interest in forming such a, a club or an organization? So uh, I'm, I'm talking out loud because we really haven't discussed formalities as to how we would extend invitations beyond the same, same <coughs> website. But I would say we could easily, with the business list we have, send out personal invitations and or email invitations to financial advisors who have clients uh, in the community uh, and then they can in turn by our invitation extend invitations to their clients oh. and then it becomes a networking event for them mm -hmm. and we're really talking two different things right? that's correct i mean yes and, and, you have a, and, and their approach is different i mean there's nothing knew about dinner clubs, right? I mean, they, they used to be the thing to do in the early stage investment. Nothing that says they can't be reintroduced or the proven concepts behind them could be offered as a, um, a structure for creating such a thing. It, it takes modest investments to moderately wealthy people, put money aside, and periodically they choose to get involved if they wish. It's just non-threatening. It's a pretty simple kind of process to put together, to be quite honest. The funds sit in interest-bearing form so you don't lose all of your money, um, but you do have the ability to you know, basically funnel that out. But we could use this opportunity zone presentation no question about it. as a networking opportunity no question for about those it. folks to be introduced to each other mm -hmm. and then let word of mouth continue or discussions continue. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Hundred percent on the Pretty wonderful. All right. Have we hooked up with the USC, USDA director? Yet? So he's going to be. He was supposed to speak tonight, uh, but he had another engagement uh, come up. So he'll be speaking to us at our next meeting, uh, which is on the twenty-sixth at three o'clock. Thanks so much. So. 
we talk about securing emergency, uh, emerging industries, uh, we're going to get to the BCC portion of this. Uh, but I think that any of us that have contact with, uh, certainly I do, prospective businesses, people that want to start or move to Brunswick, well, we have, we've got a selling feature here that I really missed the boat on for a long time. Um, I mean, our, our desire to, which I'm so active in two or three pieces here that are, are quite often looking for candidates to participate in some way, shape, and form, and that's UNCWCIE and Tech Mountain. Um, they have no idea we have an interest in this area. The clues with regard to that. And I'd be more than happy to put that on the table with Diane or Amanda or anybody else. Uh, but we should probably flesh out exactly what it is I'm putting on the table yeah. and yeah. what I'm looking for out of their group of mentors as well as uh, proven successful business people who have come into the area. They don't have to be on this side of the river. Mr. Chairman. Because the opportunities could be here. Uh, the monies and the interested parties could be on the other side. Which organization in Wilmington would be likely to be talking to I think I've got to get to spread the word out through the SCORE organization about what's going on here in Brunswick County. That would be helpful. I mean, you have, you got a little small pockets like Bloomington Investment Network, that's the WIN group. Um, what's um, what's um, Roberts' group? Um, yeah. Um, there, there are a couple of small pockets. Connection that, investors. No. That's correct. And they almost all operate with an association of some established interested parties that are looking for great opportunities and to park some of their funds. I mean, there, there are these little pockets. I think it, it, I'd like to think that the spirit of collaboration will someday arise in this area. But sometimes when you present yourself as a candidate across the river, it's the, oh my gosh, you know, doesn't work. Does, Kind of thing, right? But still, collaboration is hard in, in the city well, as a whole. Most of those clubs have invested in startups outside of Wilmington. Well, and <clears throat> what I think we've learned is that nobody pitches them properly to convince them to invest their money here, and maybe we become the first group to do that. Uh, but there's got to be solid Clad, opportunities. Yeah, Ironclad's probably the exception. Yeah, and where right. he where he does investing yeah. on his own. Yeah, and places like that. So there. There are places where we could make this level of interest on our part to either participate or in some fashion support ongoing activities that I think we can get connected very quickly. I just need to, we need to come up with the messaging that is consistent with what the town wants yeah. to be. And I'll be happy to go up and pitch it. And I will be happy to get some kind of a blurb into the SCORE national newsletter. There are 11,000 people like me that are talking to people that want to move, grow. I mean, it's quite conceivable. In the Northeast, there are guys up there that own a business. And they say, you know, enough of Connecticut and these stupid taxes. I want to move south. Mm -hmm. They go to SCORE looking for help on how to. Those people up there knew about the opportunities <coughs> in the England, including the opportunity zones. And they give them, give them a little heads up, at yeah. least. If, yeah, we, I mean, we've always talked about uh, old money, and when we associate old money, we tend to think about older, established business people from you know years past. The group that's moving here are the the high-end millennials that, that overlap the uh, baby boomer group, who have made a lot of money in technology in the kind of industries that were that we believe to be innovative, that we believe to be clean and things of that area. They come here with having had success uh -huh. because they're choosing the opportunity to leave wherever they were that they made that money to come to Wilmington or to one of the beaches along the area. They have no place to go when they get here. Yeah, you hear that all the time. I think uh, Mike had a question. Uh, you mentioned CIE. Uh, uh, CIE. I'm sorry? CIE. 
See, I yeah. had over you and see the right. Chuck Whitlock was the acting director of that. Who? Chuck Whitlock. Oh yeah, yeah. And I, I, he's no longer involved. Okay. He's no longer. He might want to be involved in something that we're, we're talking about. Yeah, I, I know he's one yeah. of those kind of guys. You also know about the mentoring program at the Cameron Business School. Sure. Which sure. some of us have belonged to. That's another opportunity to engage some of the folks in this opportunity zone idea right. because a lot of those folks come from the kinds of backgrounds we're talking about. Right. Right. Just a couple of ideas. Yeah, the thing that's new about the CIE, although we've heard about it for I don't know how many years, is that the program under Diane Durant is radically new and different um, and has now upwards to 85 mentors as part of that network. Um, at best, when I first arrived, there were 10 or 15 that were involved. So it's really grown. But, uh, yeah. Back to you, John. All right, how do we go about targeting microbrewing industry and malting particularly? So I that? think that probably would start with the agricultural side. And we'll hear more from the gentleman that's going to be speaking to us. So Fair I think on. that's where the connection will All right, start. Hold. Hold. Okay, um, we've done the study on the Port Authority strategic plan. But we really need to meet with that CEO, the formal one. What was his last name? Uh, he was former chair for that, Tom Adams. Tom Adams. He was former chair for the board. And it looks like we have them queued up for April the 11th. Excellent. All right, making headway. Um, I'm going to have to modify substantially this last one that says create the uh, one that involves BCC. There we go. Mm -hmm. So cooperation with PCC and its unique offerings. I've got a lot of bad nomenclature in there, um, but uh, I will clean it up based on your presentation. I, I just say that uh, we gained a lot from your last two visits. Thank mm -hmm. you. Have I missed anything, Mr. Gary? I can't actually read my own writing here. No, uh, in support of the Linear Innovation Park Initiative, uh, basically supporting what the board for that group is doing and hopes to do. Uh, I would, you know, I'll be the liaison between what they're doing and the support we can give them, as will Mr. Mancinelli. He's on the advisory board for that group. Uh, special tax exempt zones, we spoke about the opportunity zones, so you know, we're, we're going to be presenting that at our next meeting. And there will be a a brief summary in the strategic plan about the availability of these North Carolina rural development loans, which are available to people with obnoxiously low credit scores and very little down payment. These loans range, they have three types of them, up to $50,000, almost no questions asked, and then up to $5 million. And the interest rates are lower than what you're going to get through the SBA. So it's a good opportunity, just something we all need to keep in mind when we're talking about Leland, uh, we need to talk about the whole package, not just the educational system, but the financial advantages that come to living in Brunswick County. These loans are not available in the Hanover. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <coughs> then the last item there is uh, voluntary annexation. Um, you know, it's no secret, secret that Leland wants to grow right. and thrive. And right now, um, the best way to do that beyond filling up our available land uh, is to annex land voluntarily, uh, which the <coughs> landowners are beginning to do more often. Um, so there'll be more of that coming as time goes on. Sure. I know this is your number one <laughs> priority in life. All right, at 7.30, the basketball game was on. So I know University of Cincinnati has a lot of interest, but some people don't. They're not on until tomorrow. <laughs> they got to buy. So they make All right, we'll keep working on this. And, uh, have another version of it ready for you on our meeting on the 26th. 26th at 3 o'clock. Okay. Thank you, John. Thank, Thank you, John. You. Well, well, John. Right now.
All right, the rest of our agenda, uh, uh, staff reports, uh, monthly reports from Gary, we have three copies of those. Gary, you want to say anything about that? Uh, no, I think it speaks for itself. Um, one point I'll make, Leland Town Center, yeah. uh, which has been in mothballs for longer than I can remember. Um, I met with the developer two weeks ago, and that project is now back on track. Uh, there will be a Chick-fil-A on that site, uh, probably sometime in early 2020, uh, as well as other buildings. Uh, it won't be done by the developer that was hoping to do it. It'll be done by the developer that has owned the land. Uh, so there'll be more to come, but um, suffice to say, the project is moving forward with the exciting news, and I think we'll probably see a press release for, for soon about that. Um, other than that, um, some new businesses that are going to be opening. Uh, I'm going to begin tracking our annexations because that is a large part of my time. Uh, we just annexed a 57-acre parcel of land um, a couple weeks ago, uh, council did. I just want to point out, uh, for the most part, these are all voluntary annexations, where the landowner and, and uh, developer controlling the land is voluntary and requesting annexation. So, um, more to come on that as well. Thank you, Gary. Any questions? Any questions, Gary? Thank you. Uh, note that our next meeting is, is the 26th at 3 o'clock here in the town hall. So we have to put that on the calendar before we adjourn. There's a uh, three-bedroom, two-bath pothole in front of uh, H2GO. I'd like everybody to visit about 40 miles an hour. <laughs> then come next door to Mike and park here. We <laughs> <laughs> saw on, on Village Road. <laughs> Nancy, please put that in the uh, <laughs> in all caps. <laughs> and now we entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. We have a motion and a second by everybody. All in favor say aye. 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 Dr. Smith, Glenn, thank you very much. John, thank the next you. meeting again, thank you.